Ooh. Oh, hello, my old chum. I'm not a goblin. I'm not a gnelf. I'm survived the jive. And you've been jived. All right, then. Tag your mates to totally jive them. Enough with the memes. Let's get on with the streams. I have to talk to you today on a serious subject. So perhaps it wasn't a good idea to begin with memory. But I, uh, I want to talk about the concepts of sacred space and sacred time. As, um, as identified, as defined by Mircea Eliade. And please forgive me if I mispronounce his name because I'm not very good with Romanian. In fact, I'm terrible. I haven't got any idea how to do that, uh, to speak that. Um, the format of today's stream will be me sort of just going straight into the subject and I'll try and keep half an eye on this, on the, your comments, but I won't be able to get really full attention to them uh, until I, because I'll be concentrating on what I'm talking about. But then after that, I'll move towards the end of the stream to just looking at what you guys are saying. And um, I'll say, uh, yeah, basically I'll answer super chats and maybe some other questions and uh, see what's uh, going on. Um, by the way, this shirt is a, a Teespring shirt, but it's not from my Teespring store. It's from Brute Norse, uh, his Teespring store. And it's a really uh, cool uh, podcast, Brute Norse. I recommended it before. If you want to know a bit more about uh, Norse mythology. I'm only, I'm not shilling it for his channel. I just saw someone ask where I got the t-shirt from. So, um, yeah, it's a cool channel. But anyway, let me get to the subject of today's stream. Jive talk number four. So, you know, in Norse myth and Norse language, enclosures are important, right? You've got a, there's a delineation of the sacred land from the profane land. And that's so important that the word for this enclosure uh, is, in, is in, in so many places, like os god, you know, or as god, people say in the anglifying, that's meaning the enclosure of the gods. And then you have the the, the giantess who uh, Lord uh, the Lord Ing or Freyr he lusts after is called Gerda, and that means sacred enclosure. And we can see many places in Scandinavia with this part guard in it. Uh, and actually, I believe that it's uh, etymologically related to the modern to the English word. Uh, Garden, which comes from French jardin, which may in turn come from a Frankish word, uh, but uh, don't hold. Uh, I'm not certain about that. I'm just if I'm remembering correctly. Anyway, um, the um, the Adam Abramson reports that the the sacred temple at Uppsala had around it a chain made of gold, and that is important. Why they need to delineate sacred space for non-sacred space. It's even in there, no, this notion of the sacred and the non-sacred is so important that it was even in like their notions of like, you know, of geography in terms of their relation of their people's land to their foreign people's land, like the Innenjärd and the Utenjärd among the Anglo-Saxons. And your main concern is within your own people's land because that's the sacred land, a center from which all other lands are to be understood. In relation to that center and the center uh, which distinguishes the sacred from the non-sacred must be an upward portal to the heavens it links the profane and the sacred like Irmen Sul, the sacred pole or Donna's oak or these symbolizing these physical objects symbolizing a sacred uh, a, a metaphysical uh, equivalent Yggdrasil the axis mundi, which links the profane to the sacred realm. Uh, thus the, the sacred is spilling over from the divine into the profane place and, and making, uh, linking our world with that. Uh, and this is, um, this is how 
by relation to it, you know, if you if you're a Germanic people tribe and you had Ir Mansul and your people, you know, knew of this link to the divine, it would be a central place by which other places could be understood. And this isn't just Germanic peoples. This is like a basic concept among uh, of religion that is almost perennial, um, but certainly found in um, in, in many different cultures, unrelated cultures, according to uh, Mircea Iriade. Um, but uh, the same concept applies to events in time as well. It's not just about space, it's about chronology, and especially with rituals. So you have the establishment of new sacred spaces is often tied in religious beliefs to an original creative act of the gods that they worship. So when Icelanders claimed new lands and named them, they were reenacting the primal work of Odin, the Vili and V, the three brothers who ended the primal rule of chaos from the giants and established a new era of order. This notion of like, of, of, of copying the gods, of reenacting the gods in your activities, which we consider now profane activities, whether they're farming, you know, delineating your land boundaries, all kinds of things. The, uh, you know, harvesting the crops or whatever. These are all not profane activities in a pagan mind or in any uh, religious mind, really, or, or old religious. Although you can say that nowadays religion is, often pertains to Abrahamic religions, who, which are not the same as most of the religions that have existed in history. Um, so it's especially apparent among uh, my people, the English. The Anglo-Saxons, when coming to England, established many sacred places in this land. Um, and there could be wells, there could be forest groves often, or temple sanctuaries, sometimes with an actual temple, but not always. Sometimes it would just be an outdoor area. Uh, so these are apparent to us in place names, uh, those ending in Harrow, which comes from Heirk, which means a pagan temple, uh, and also by those that uh, have incorporated the term Weos. And you can see that in place names like Weford, Wyford B. Whaley, Willy, or Weedon. Um, so this uh, Weos can be translated either as an idol, specifically it's been thought to re represent probably a, a, a god pole, that's like a, a wooden uh, post which represents a god and may have had a god carved onto it or may not have. Um, or in fact, indeed a sanctuary in which such a, a, a pole uh, was placed, a, sac a sacred ground. Well, in the Exeter book, which is one, I think, the oldest book in the English language, it's here in Devon. Um, it's an Anglo-Saxon manuscript collection of different things. And it says in one section, Warden Wartoheos. Warden wrought the idols. So when the English, or the sanctuaries, Woden made the sanctuaries, Woden made the idols first. When the English make the, it made the image of a god pole, or, or they declared a sacred ground, to be sacred, they weren't merely scratching their chins and you know choosing somewhere they thought looked nice. They weren't merely working on a, a piece of wood as a, as a man would make a table. They were embodying the actions of their beloved God and participating in the original creative act that Woden began. And sacred time is associated with myth and calendar rites. Uh, so all sacred festivals pertain to sacred time, uh, which exists for religious man outside the constraints of profane time. Therefore, May Day is connected to all May Days, when rites of fire and of symbolic goddesses, May Queen that is, that these, these are performed, these rituals, and that each May Day is like the feeling of that day. It's the same as it was every year. And that day is linked in time. The day is more has more in common with the day, the same day from the year before than it does uh, from the year before of that date than it does with the day before, because all these May days are held in one time, one sacred time that takes place outside the passing of profane chronology, and that this time is the same as the original divine time, which the rite itself symbolizes. So just as sacred space is motivated by desire to live close to the gods, as I said, with that, you know, 
upward portal in the case of the Germanic peoples with a, a sacred tree or something or, or, or a god pole. Well, so is the case with these festivals reintegrate the sacred origin, the time of origin, when the gods and the sacred ancestors were present. And that becomes part of the, 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 the kind of time that they can experience. This time takes place outside of history, but can be integrated into it. You see, this is it's not the same as Christianity and Islam when a historical person, like a prophet, and belief in his historicity, the historicity is the central tenet of that belief system. You can't be a Christian and not believe in the historical person of Christ. And, and of course, at his divinity. But I mean, for example, in Islam, you can't be a Muslim and not believe Muhammad was a real person. You can't just say, I believe his works were good. These works are good and they were works of many people and they're symbolic or whatever. It's not really what Islam's about. This is about historic, the historic events about Muhammad's life are part of the belief system. That is not the case with any pagan religion. However, historical events like migrations, they could be incorporated into existing pagan mythologies. So since the establishment of sacred land brings man closer to his gods, it therefore makes sense that the gods and sacred heroes should be present in the mythological accounts of this event. So, I mean, Homer's works, like you're talking about a real event, the Trojan War happened, but a lot of this is integrated with stories of the gods that are probably much older, much, much older than the, you know, than the, the Trojan War. So you can see that integration is a natural thing to happen. Bring it back to us English. Hengist and Horsa were the sacred ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons, the sacred progenitors of our people, but they were already worshipped as gods long, long before English people existed or England existed. You see, um, in the Prose Edda, it does mention Hengist and Horsa, but there it's no connection to England. It's, they're said to be descendants of Odin, who ruled over Saxony. So as a Christian source, all of the Christian sources, whether we have, got, they have mentioned, they've got, we've got Celtic Welsh sources that mention Hengist and Horsa, that's uh, Nennius and also Geoffrey of Monmouth. You've got the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and Bede, as two Anglo-Saxon sources that mention them. Uh, you've got mention of Beowulf, in, in Beowulf it mentions Hengist, that's Anglo-Saxon, and then you've got the Icelandic reference of uh, Hengist and Horsa, and all of them, turn Hengist and Horsa into human beings. That's euhemerization, which is a, a process that the Christians did with many divine uh, ancestors and gods. But they were gods originally, and you can see the same thing, or they may have been sort of thought of as like gods on earth, perhaps, like uh, they've been reduced to the status of mere progenitors, but the same thing happened with Romulus and Remus. However, other divine Progenitor twins are found in different Indo-European religions, such as the Ashvin twins, and these are gods in Hinduism. So you can see that originally that it comes from a god, a twi two gods, twins associated with horses. Um, well, Hengist and Horsa are, are described by Bede as the sons of Wictil, son of Wita, son of Wecta, son of Woden. So just like in the Icelandic sources, they're still descended from Woden or Odin except uh, we know that that's originally a god. So we can think that before Christianization, the Anglo-Saxons and Norse and other Germanic peoples saw them as uh, gods. Um, but uh, similarly, Nennius and Geoffrey of Monmouth and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle all say that uh, they were originally mercenaries, uh, actually human mercenaries that uh, they're apparently working for the Celtic King Vortigern. So he invited them over to help um, fight against some other Celts or whatever and uh, eventually they decided to stay and brought over all the other Anglo-Saxons. So the, I'd say that what's happened here is that this integration process of integrating the anglo uh, the Hengist and Horsa into the establishment of, um, of the English people in Britain didn't take place under Christian times because we can see the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons doing it uh, in different ways after conversion. Uh, and unrelated ways, maybe. So what's really happened is that first he was seen as a divine, they were seen as divine ancestors in um, who helped establish the Saxon race in Germany. 
And then after the as many Saxons migrated to England, they decided that this, well, they naturally reintegrated this sacred establishment of sacred space in England because this now they're doing this, they're recreating the original creative act of sacred time. So that act of establishing a colony on the British Isles became a sacred time. Therefore, sacred ancestors were present when they tell of that time. Therefore, Hengus and Horsa were the ones who established this land. And then later on, when the Christians tell the story, they reduce them to the status of men and just say that they were actual people. So you can see a clear way of how that, now you get this idea of, of how sacred time is conceived of. You, you can see about how we should approach it. Like I have, will do another stream at some point where I talk, you know, more specifically about specific calendar festivals maybe and how what rights go for it and what don't but i think what's important when people get really bogged down by oh this is how this is the exact date this is time whether or not some people pagans want to celebrate solar or lunar or uh what kind of of high festivals that they're doing i'm not here to tell everyone exactly which festivals they should and shouldn't observe and how what dates and things i put out a calendar a while ago to try and help people um, I'll, put, I'll post a link to it after this, this the stream's finished. Um, but that calendar is, is, is advisory because I understand that you're going to be part of a local half or like a community. And it's mainly advisory for Germanic pagans, but I put the cognate festivals of other Indo-European festivals where relevant so you can get ideas about what's at the core of this. Now, I think that's important because it's, we have to understand something. Our way of looking at time has changed irreparably. We can't recover a, a form of, of, uh, of sacred time quite naturally. So, uh, you know, quite so naturally. Having been um, grown up in and been integrated into a notion of linear time, which derives from Christianity, but is also integrated into everything now. I mean, Islam derives from Christianity in many ways, and it has that linear concept of time and historical time and sacred time are now the same thing in many ways. I mean, Christianity does have sacred time, for example, mass and Christmas or whatever. They have these sacred festivals too, but it's not quite the same. Like, I mean, Christmas is a way you should be, as a Christian, you're meant to be brought back to the time of, of Christ's birth. And I think in a way they, they have that, but it's not quite the same level that it was for a pagan uh, and for pagan communities now when you can see them like tribal societies have now. Um, so we who choose to practice paganism now are not as capable of recovering that word, way of seeing. And I see, and I think you have to be conscious of that because then you can check yourself when you're making mistakes. For example, many people want to integrate uh, a, a profane, the profane uh, narrative of history uh, about historical events into their practice, um, you know, and sometimes it was an, it's not even an accurate profane history anyway, to be honest. Uh, but I mean, it's just this is in this is like a this is a Christian activity, you know, like you start with the, the year zero of the coming of Christ as a historical person, and then you go on from that. So like. Everything is built around actual profane historical events and not on uh, sacred time and sacred events and sacred mythology. And if you, if you use that as your basis for whatever kind of rites you're doing and whatever rites you're performing, then you're on the right track. And, um, uh, and, and perhaps whatever group you operate with, you will establish these rites according to, to these principles. It doesn't matter as much how divergent they become because there's a natural amount of divergence between different uh, peoples and uh, in practice anyway. Oh, how am I doing for time? Only 17 minutes in. I think I should just uh, dip into the questions now and see what you guys are talking about. Um, let me see if there's any super chats. Uh, only one, and I shall not answer that. No silly questions, please, but thanks for the super chat. All right, uh, there's lots to look at here. Mm -mm -mm. Survive the dive, can give it a bit. There's too much to read. Everyone's talking about the Celts and things. 
Yeah, well, someone says, are you familiar with Monsieur Iliada? Yes, I am. I was just reading from him. Really, I mean, not reading from him, but this, what I was just saying was based a lot on what he's saying. I can read some bits out of, from that sort of go along with what I've just been saying. For a religious man, even the most primitive does not refuse progress in principle. He accepts it, but at the same time bestows on it a divine origin and dimension. Everything that from the modern point of view seems to us to have signified progress of whatever kind, whether social, cultural, technical, etc., in comparison with a previous situation, all this the various primitive societies have accepted in the course of their long history as a series of new divine revelations. But for the moment, we shall leave this aspect of the problem aside. What is of primary importance to us is to understand the religious meaning of this repetition of divine acts and gestures. Now, it seems obvious that if religious man feels the need of indefinitely reproducing the same paradigmatic acts and gestures, this is because he desires and attempts to live close to his gods. Let me see, I've got some other quote from here that's worth reading. Uh, mm, mm. To wish to reintegrate the time of origin is also to wish to return to the presence of the gods to recover the strong, fresh, pure world that existed in illo tempore. It is at once thirst for the sacred and nostalgia for being. On the existential plane, this experience finds expression in the certainty that life can be periodically begun over again with a maximum of good fortune. Indeed, it is not only an optimistic vision of existence, but a total cleaving to being by all his behavior Religious man proclaims that he believes only in being and that his participation in being is assured in him by the primordial revelation of which he is the guardian. The sum total of primordial revelations is constituted by his myths. Yeah, he must have missed the beginning where I specifically said that I, I was going to do that. Uh, our, someone says that's uh, from a guy called Mac. Thank, thank you uh, for your uh, donation. Um, are Jews Indo-European genetically speaking? Well, that's uh, an, a, an odd question because what is Indo-European genetically speaking? Uh, there's two, I mean, Indo-European is a language family that's derived from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Now, uh, their blood, the blood of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, they say this is the Yamnaya, who, if we say it's them, uh, who, who, who it's spread from, well, are Jews Yamnaya? No. Do 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 Hebrew is Hebrew an Indo-European language? No. Uh, does that answer the question? But then again, like if we say something like, are Spanish people Indo-European? Well, Spanish is an Indo-European language. Are they Yamnaya? No, they're not. They have about twenty percent Yamnaya DNA or something like that, I think. Uh, do Jewish people have any Yamnaya DNA? Yes, they do. Not that much, but they have some. Uh, so I don't. Maybe I think there's a problem with your question. If, if is someone Indo-European genetically? I don't know what that means. Like the some people with the most Indo-European blood, blood from Indo-Europeans, proto-Indo-Europeans are the Finns, and they are not Indo-European because they don't speak an Indo-European language. So I think you're confused about what Indo-European is. If you want to say a question, you could ask: Do Jewish people have much Yamnai ancestry? That's a good question. Or is Hebrew an Indo-European language? That's a question. But uh, this one is a bit strange. But which settled first, the Palestinian or the Jew? Well, both Palestinians and Jewish people are descended from the prehistoric Levantine people. So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, thank you for the Snapchat, Bobby Sands. I uh, hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, oh, another Mac. What about Yiddish? Doesn't it have some Indo-European language? Yiddish is a Germanic language. It derives from German and has some Slavic elements. It derived, it grew up in uh, the Holy Roman Empire, as did the Ashkenazi Jews. Yiddish is a language that the Ashkenazi Jews used to, uh, to develop to speak within the Holy Roman Empire. It has some Slavic influences, and it, but it's mainly German. It's sort of almost just a dialect of, Ger of German at the time, uh, which was written in Hebrew characters. So that means a non-Indo-European script and a an Indo-European uh, language. 
but it also has a few Hebrew words, of course, but that doesn't stop it being in the European language because there are many non non in the European words that we use like alcohol, for example, that's an Arabic word, but it doesn't mean that because I said alcohol doesn't mean it's not that English isn't in the European. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of chat going. On. It's too fast for me to read. Uh, German Chancellor Angela. Today, my folk. Oh, what does it say? Oh. Today, verbo tempestas. Today, my folk tithe goes to you. Thank you for your contributions to making our community better. Hail our folk. Thank you very much for that kind. Uh, I'm glad that you shall uh, you honour me in this way. I'm very privileged uh, and uh, uh, pleased to hear so, and I'll continue to do what I can to contribute. Another generous donation from Wodnaz Algo. Why do Scottish people have more Yamnaya ancestry than the English? Were the Celts, who the Anglo-Saxons mixed with, genetically different from Scottish? Well, okay, unpack this properly. The reason why England has less Yamna ancestry than Scotland may have nothing to do with Anglo-Saxon times or anything from the medieval times or even older. It could be explained quite simply by the fact that um, over time, there's always, not without my massive migration events in history, just over time, people mix a little bit. And the southern part of England, has only a small bit of sea between it and France and Belgium. So over time, little bits of French DNA will come into the South. There wasn't an invasion. It's not from an invasion of French people, just little bits. And that French people have less Yamna DNA. So that would mean that the Southern part of England gets gradually less Yamna. The Ang was there a difference between the Anglo-Saxons and the Celts in Britain? Yes, there was a genetic difference. They were all descended from the Belbica people of, of of Northern Europe, the Celts and the, the, the insular Celts and the Anglo-Saxons. So they had only been separated for a couple of thousand years genetically. And they were cousins in that sense, but they were still different. Anglo-Saxons had a lot more Yamnai ancestry um, than any of the Celts in Britain. But the Celts in Britain were all different as well, because just as you have now, the further south you go, because all of Europe is like, a a climb. The further north you go, the more Yamna ancestry there is. And the further south you go, the less there is. The further west and north you go, the more w Western Hunter Gatherer ancestry there is uh, as well. So, and that in Britain's the same way. On the, uh, it's the same. Like the further up north you go, because of just the way that uh, the DNA, like the, just assimilates, uh, it's going to go to the corner of the British Isles last. So the Scottish, therefore. The Scottish, uh, even before the Anglo-Saxon uh, invasion, I'm sure the Celts up on above Hadrian's Wall were genetically different from the Celts on the other side of it. Uh, and then for a while, the south, south of England got then more Yamnai because of the Anglo-Saxons. And then after a while, that sorts to level out. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Wodnaz. Uh, here's a, uh, one from, uh, are you familiar with Tor Heidel's theory on the origin of Asir and Asajiban? Yes, I am, Helter Skelter, and I've mentioned this in a lecture, which I explain why it's nonsense. It's just euhemerism. Like, actually, you don't need to, uh, you can ask literally any historian in the world, and they understand, like, euhemerism as a, as a commonplace narrative in medieval um, medieval stories. Every medieval nation in the medieval times, euhemerized ancient the the pagan gods all of them did this is a normal christian thing happened everywhere and they always try to like make them seem good by showing them to live in the east i've done a long lecture on this it's on there it's cool it's it was in i did the lecture in america actually uh just have a look on the it was called the indo-european narratives also or origin narratives so just held skull to open that and you'll understand not only why tor heidel was completely wrong he was wrong about a lot of things he was wrong about the polynesians you know migrating to america as well great man tor heidel a heroic explorer but wrong about a lot of things um okay any more questions let me go through again how long have we got oh we're about halfway through 
uh, why marry a Swede when you focus on English identity? Well, I just uh, because I was I, w I went I met a Swede and I fell in love with her. That's how it happened. So uh, I don't have some autistic uh, thing about it. Uh, are you? Uh, how can I? What kind of music do I listen to? Asked Koher. Well, I listen to a ridiculous, like, a lot of some people, you know, annoying people when you ask me what music they say that. I listen to all kinds of music. Well, I uh, I have had, like, um, I had a Last FM profile and I sent it to a, a friend of mine once and he said that it was weird how diverse my musical tastes are. But it should be, bear in mind that I, not only have I performed, I used to, to be performing in bands and things. And later I was a music journalist for a long time. So it's just like natural that I would have just gone through so many different types of music. I liked growing up John Peel because he, uh, uh, he like maybe, I like he has a really diverse taste of music. So I can listen to like classical music. Uh, I, li I like some, he a bit, some heavy, like I like music for function as well. Like if I want to have a transcendent uplifting music, I'll listen to, uh, some classical maybe. One of my favorite bands are I love Krautrock, Popolver and Noi are two of my favorite bands, and that also has a transcendent aspect. And then I like some other uh, pop music that can have transcendent qualities too, like uh, from the especially stuff from the eighties. Some like Cocteau Twins can sometimes have that. But I also like if in the gym I really like this the heavy metal because I need something testosteroneous and aggressive to like trigger like you know. You get you get lift, do that extra that extra rep and then you know you really really push yourself. I can't listen to uh, rap music or anything. I can't listen to R and B or anything like that sort of. I can't listen to dance music. I can't stand anything like that. But I can listen to so many different types of music. I can listen to blues. I can listen to rock and roll. I like some fifties rock and roll music. I love country music as well. American country music. I listen to quite a lot of that. Um, blues grass. Uh, uh, I like synth, and I like synth way before this whole uh, right wing thing happened, with, where it got picked up by the uh, like as a, an alt right music. I was into it long before that, so I was very pleased to see that uh, the right wing people picking picking up synth way because I've always loved it. Um, yeah, God, that was a pretty annoying answer, I guess, but yeah, now you know my favorite band at least. Okay, we got some Nicholas Enu. So our right should be doing as the gods do. The first primordial act of slaughtering Ymir is the first sacrifice. Yeah. So why do you think that sacrifice was so important in paganism? Because sacrifice is the is the original creative act. So if you perform a sacrifice, you are not to do it like going through the numbers, like like you're doing your work or whatever. This is a, an act that you're you're one of the first things you do when you perform any rite is you establish sacred space. You need to do, as I said at the beginning, wherever that's like even Wiccans understand this, where they're drawing a circle in chalk or something. You establish the sacred space and delineate it from the non sacred space. And then you establish a sacred time and you're, um, you, you're showing that this is the same time as before and you are embodying a sacred entity. The ones performing the rites become as the gods. They are you, if you're the, the one who is performing the sacrifice is the original sacrificer. This is you know, and you're you're establishing order. You're re you're doing the same thing. You're having the same function of re-establishing the the primacy of the original creative act. Hope that answers your question, Nicholas. Sykes, Alec. Uh, thank you for your donation. Have you read any works by Sir Burton of Torquay? No, sorry, I haven't. Uh, oh, here's an interesting question. Jonas, since we pray to the gods in order to come closer to the one or the Tao, mm, yeah, uh, are the gods to be perceived as separate beings or just part of the ultimate source? Uh, maybe there's some 
maybe I won't go into the, this distinguishing the one from Tao and Taoism, but I certainly can see why they could be conflated. But um, the, 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 also there's a problem with the dichotomy of being separate beings or being uh, part, just part of the ultimate source. While they are separate beings and a part of the ultimate source would still be a separate being. I mean, we're, we are all human. I am not you, Jonas, but you and I are both part of the, of the one. Yeah, hope that you understand what I'm saying. Um, is it Nordic? Is it Nordic tradition to drink and tattoo? Yeah, of course. I thought that was well known. Um, uh, alcohol had an enormous uh, important role in Germanic and Celtic societies as a social and in religious uh, functions as well. And tattooing exists also in many uh, Indo-European cultures, from the Scythians to the Norse. Uh, so, yeah. Um, am I still working my book? No, I haven't got time. I haven't got time. I mean, it takes me so long to do research for a video, and then I do a video, and then I've got my job and my house to, to manage. So, um, I, uh, yeah, I just don't have time at the moment. I, I mean, I collect all the stuff and research I'm doing. I'm, I, got, I devote sometimes to research. And that research is used for videos, and I write up stuff for the video. So uh, technically, I mean, this could all go in my book one day. I could just collect all the stuff that, from the videos and make them as chapters in a big book. But I haven't been. I just ceased work on the book, uh, and I wrote so much for it. It was pretty big anyway. But um, I wasn't comfortable with publishing it because I, I've revised and um, c improved my vision of my, my understanding. So. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I want to make it as good as I can. So, no, I'd rather not publish at all unless it, I'm confident that I've got something that's going to really be helpful uh, and not going to, yeah, I don't want to lead people down the wrong path. Um, yeah. Do I speak Swedish? Yeah, I speak a bit of Swedish. I did Swedish lessons for a year. I speak a bit of French, a bit of Spanish. I I went. I lived in Venezuela for three months when I did that Venezuela documentary that early on for the channel. That was in 2008. And I didn't speak a word of Spanish when I set foot there. And in Venezuela, people don't speak English. So I just had to learn it on the gut, on the fly. So I picked up bits of it. But you had to do French in school. I also had to do German, but I didn't learn very much German. I, I can get by in Germany and France, like in France more easily, like, I can just, you know, I can get by like ordering, talking, going to a hotel, ordering a restaurant, food or whatever, understanding basic questions. But I can't have an, an involved conversation. And the same with Swedish. Like I got the, the basics of Swedish stuff. Um, did I meet Uga Chavez? No, I didn't meet him. I, I met uh, the uh, ambassador, Samuel Moncada, uh, the British ambassador, though. I was accused of being a CIA agent when I was there. I got, they got an AK-47 shoved in my face, and people thought I was a. a, a when I was looking at, um, uh, what was it called? The, the State Oil Company. I was just trying to get some uh, peek, a, peek a look at what they were doing in the an oil field because the government took over all the oil places, and they did. They see a white guy creeping about, and they <laughs> they thought I was a spy. So uh, I thought it was funny because obviously if they had a CIA spy, they wouldn't have sent a white guy. They would have sent someone who could blend in more. Um, uh, Pre-Indo-Europeans come from the same as Western hunter-gatherers originally. Uh, Cousin Groypley, no, the Indo-Europeans didn't have any Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. They had an Eastern hunter-gatherer ancestry. That's a different hunter-gatherer group. Most of our hunter-gatherer ancestry comes from Eastern hunter-gatherers, which we got via the Yamna, via the Indo-Europeans, rather than from Western hunter-gatherers. Well, when I say we, I mean, I'm not sure, not all Europeans. In obviously, Eastern Europeans, all, all Europeans have both Eastern and Western hunter-gatherer ancestry, but uh, obviously it's in the West, like you get more Western. So Spanish people have more probably Western hunter-gatherer ancestry than you. But uh, certainly like Russians have more Eastern European hunter-gatherer ancestry. And those, those populations were distinct 
for example, blue eyes uh, come from Western hunter gatherers, but um, blonde blondism or def maybe blondism, but definitely lighter skin is uh, that the genes that we now have for lighter skin are from Eastern hunter gatherers. Uh, or were present in Eastern undergatherers is more correct to say. <laughs> what race, culture, or tribes wore a moustache? Loads of them. This is a blog I did on, on Survivor Dive years ago. It was like one of the first blog posts I did on, like, God, it must be 10 years ago now or something. Uh, and, uh, okay, you've got one of the earliest depictions in the European, I mean, it's a Pajaric horseman, some Scythian tribe guy. He's on a horse. And he's uh, wearing, got a big moustache. All these Norse stuff, we see so many depictions. They either, all of them, they all either have a beard or they have a, just a moustache. Uh, there's there's not clean shaven Norse. I mean, they, if they cut off their beard, they never cut off the moustache. Celts depicted that way. Anglo Saxons, look at the, well, you've got the Sutton New Helmet, Tash. You've got a Tash, but no beard. Look at the Bayer Tapestry. All the Anglo Saxons depicted the same way no beard. And a tash. So tash is like, is like a very old school way look. And I used to rock that look for a while, but then uh, I decided I look better with a full beard, so I got rid of it. I I grew it out. <laughs> what cultural aspects Brit unify British and Scots? That doesn't make any sense. Scots are British. What do you think Scotland is? <laughs> what, do, what country do you come from where you think you don't even know where Scotland is? Britain is an island. Scotland is the northern part of Britain. Fucking annoying when people say shit like that. What, unif what aspects unify uh, New York State with the American continent or something? It doesn't make sense. Versing Getrix had a moustache. Yeah, probably did. I don't know. I don't know if there's contemporary depictions of him. What is that, a coin or something? Yeah, the Tash is a long history. And in India as well, of course. Indian India, like, it's depicted as it was seen that moustache is seen as a sign of masculinity. So man has to have a moustache among the Hindus. That's partly why I think that the Muslims developed this culture of ch cut, cutting off the moustache and growing the beard instead because they wanted to distinguish themselves from like Indian people or something. Like that. And I think that's why they did it. But um, it's some extremist thing. But you know, when British people started growing massive moustaches in Victorian times, that was because we wanted to see, like, to help us rule over India. Because in India, like, they wouldn't respect people without tashes. And the bigger your tash, the more manly you were. So we started growing massive tashes so the Indians would respect us. Can Germanic paganism be practiced in isolation? Is a community required for some sacrifices or rituals? Definitely community is important. I, I keep saying this, like, it doesn't matter what, what paganism, it doesn't matter what religion. There is no religion that is, is practiced in isolation, except uh, hermit Christianity. But that is, that even then, like, to become a Christian hermit, you first would need to be, you know, receive instruction in the Christian religion, within a church or a monastery. You can't just go into the, be a hermit. And there's nothing equivalent in paganism. It's communal, it's about your communal uh, shared relationship with the, with the divine. That's what the actual, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct in saying this, I, I might not be, but the root etymology of religion is even related to that idea of binding together. I mean, what is the word Germanic? It refers to a people. Why are you practicing a religion of a people if you're not practicing it with other people? Hope that helps you, JR Captain. So, and thank you for your super chat. Archie Fisher, thanks for your super chat. Generous donation. What should you do if you're interested in the personal spiritual ben benefits of a religion, but you feel held back by a strong belief that they're all just made up? I, uh, I this is a very good question. This belief that they're made up, this is the problem that you're starting with, is belief. And you, we have, you've been all, it's important to recognize everyone, all of us here, it doesn't matter who you think you are or what you say about your religion, whether you were raised a Catholic, a Protestant or an atheist, or you can say you were raised in a secret pagan society, which probably you're lying if you say that, but let's say you are, you are part of a, of the culture of the West, assuming that you're, you're a Westerners, which is, 
totally built on first by the presumptions of the Christian religion and then from that the presumptions of secular and late atheistic humanism that are integrated into everything and this requires the disenchantment of the world and this deliberately makes you question anything that is outside that worldview so this is why many people who try to participate in rituals find themselves sniggering they feel like a bit like uh, tittering and nervous like they don't they feel absurd they think is this larping they think like this isn't like an authentic action and that's because you haven't been honest with yourself first first you need to understand that um that the limitations of your induction that, that your indoctrination has imposed on you and then you need to start you can you can begin by participating in the right in an honest way like I've already begun, I've already said in this stream about all the things you need to do to perform proper right. I've already said in a video on how to perform prayers properly. You need to perform regular rituals and rites. The belief isn't actually a central aspect of it, that in paganism, no one questioned how intense your beliefs are. Belief is, an as is a, a tenet of faith for Abrahamic monotheism. In paganism, it's only important that you were seen to participate in the correct state or you know social festivals and activities that you are required to participate in so um you know i believe that the more that you participate in right and prayer the more the more you will start to uh, relieve yourself of the burden of uh of you know secular uh humanistic atheistic uh non-religious uh, perspectives which prevent you from having a proper relationship with the divine and and afterwards you will you will naturally come to a, a better understanding but you 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 start you, you're going to start it with action right so don't think you have to begin with, sinc with with sincere belief and then you can act on that act act first and um and that's where that's piety piety is 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 action is in your action not your belief nicholas says hot take paganism needs to be a state religion but there is no requirement to believe just participate in festivals well that's what rome was that's what that's what um i mean that's what a lot of i'm sure that's what happened in north we can see equivalents like what was threatening what was threatening to the pagans in rome about the jews was not their beliefs they didn't really care about their beliefs was that they but only that their belief prevented them from participating in the rituals as they were required to as everyone was required to similarly you can see um king hark on the good he says everyone must you know like everyone must participate in your feast even if they're christians i mean uh the, the you uh, like this was said by pagans as well before like Everyone had to, well, King Harkin the Good actually said you had to participate in either Christmas or Yule, but you had to do one or the other. But before then it was said everyone, the pagans said everyone had to participate in Yule. Doesn't matter what you believe, even if you just converted to Christianity, you have to participate in the Yule feast. You have to provide as things for the sacrifice, whether that's uh, the grain or the whatever, you've got to contribute because that is the, like for them, religion is just everything. It's not like one, you've got your religion and you've got the secular. The, se the division between the secular and the religious sphere is a modernist, uh, you know, post enlightenment uh, product of Christian thought in the West. It didn't, it doesn't exist in other, other kind of religions. So, um, yeah, that's why, like, from the pagans concerned, when they have people who profess other religions, they don't really understand or care what that means. They're just saying, yeah, all right, but you're going to be at the sacrifice, right? Because if you're not, you're going to be punished by law. Uh, so it, that shows a, an aspect of their belief, but let's not be unrealistic. When people say hot take, you know, you're saying it's a nice thing, Nicholas, paganism ought to be a state religion. It's not gonna be a state religion anytime soon, is it? Right? How many of us are there? There's not many of us. So just be realistic here. Like this is, uh, we're not a, we're not a, we're a very small minority of people. A lot of people think we're, you know, at best zany, um, at worst, you know, they say a lot of, you know, you know bad things about us so don't expect that anytime soon realistically just try to be the best pagan you can be mm. 
What's your opinion on Stephen Flowers and the Rune Guild? This is a chat from Jesper Hawkinson. I like uh, a lot of his work. I've read some of his blogs and I've got one of his books uh, on rune law. And it starts off, rune law starts off with a very um, his, historical uh, account of the, the development of runes and the use of runes in different contexts. And then uh, finishes with him uh, espousing his own uh, view on how uh, a modern practice of, of uh, rune law and rune runic activities uh, can could work and could and how it could look and his esoteric understandings of the runes which are based on his interpretations of uh historical understandings of them and i think he's done a lot of good work that was from a long time ago and i know that he's he's moved on in his uh intellectual pursuits since then but uh yeah that's um that's all i can say uh, i guess uh, yeah it was a, an interesting read some of the stuff i don't know if i believe in everything that he believes in but it doesn't like i said before I does that doesn't really matter, does it? Because like, what's important isn't like whether Stephen Flowers' interpretations of the runes are exactly the same as what they were by the Norse uh, uh, 1,200 years ago. What's important is whether Stephen Flowers' interpretations of the runes correspond with uh, a, 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 a truthful, uh, whether they make a, a practice of a, 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 a right that actually corresponds with metaphysical truth and brings people into a better understanding of the divine uh, that they that, that helps them in their in their religious life. And uh, uh, from what I gather, a lot of people uh, do benefit from his work in that way. So no problem. <laughs> New Shatterhand, aren't recessive and dominant genes proof against the lefty dream of all brown world with everyone having the same mixed genes? A certain percentage will have the dominant genes after mixing. Uh, think think about what you're saying. Think about what you're saying there. How could a chimpanzee, how could like apes, how could like we evolve from fish and become something else unless it was not possible for, for phenotypes to change? You, you believe in evolution, right? <laughs> or like, you believe in the genetic transition between forms from natural selection, right? <laughs> like you think like if a, if a fish is blonde, then <laughs> then the then the the amphibian and then the reptile and then the mammals that he devotes will have to be blonde or something or come on. But uh, thank you for your Snapchat new chat at hand. Uh Uh, well, coming back to the other ones. Okay, I've got 10 more minutes. Um, Looking for a question. Looking for a question. Oh, I got a Snapchat. Um, Baron, not Snapchat, what's it called? Super Chat. Some time ago, according to Baron Munchausen, thank you very much for your, your uh, Super Chat, by the way, Baron. Some time ago, I stumbled across a book called The Man Diet, and it helped me be healthier and raised my T, meaning testosterone. The author advocates for game meat against factory farming. What are your thoughts on diet? I advocate for game meat. I love game meat. I love rabbit. I eat rabbit. Or if I can shoot a rabbit or if I can get someone to shoot a rabbit for me, I eat it, skin it on the back garden. I rip the skin off. I eat the liver, the heart. I eat the, everything. And then uh, uh, my the landlord at the local pub, whenever he shoots pheasant, he brings him here, hangs him on my door. Or sometimes they're hanging in the pub for me. I go in for a pint. I'll come home with two pheasant over my over my shoulder. Pluck the the thing. Pluck them. Get all the giblets. I eat everything. It's great. And then when I've eaten them, I take the bones and I boil them up and I drink the broth because it, everything's good for you in it. It's my. It's, I like. Uh, I eat farmed animals too. I'm not one of the. I not. I don't have a strict diet of any kind. I just eat every meal. I have meat, 
which is, it can be game, but we only have a game season for some part of the year. Um, it can just be farmed meat, but if it's farmed, I try and eat organic or like, you know, decent quality if I can, uh, meat and then some vegetables. It's just normal food that everyone's already always eaten for a long time. I don't eat like all meat. I don't eat all game. And I, I eat fish as much as I can too, but because there's a lot of things in fish that you, you don't get from meat. So you should occasionally eat fish to get the oils and stuff. And the vitamin D is, in shellfish is very good, especially in winter. If you eat oysters or scallops or something like there's loads of, there's loads of vitamin D in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's my thoughts on diet. Don't eat lots of sugar. Don't eat lots of processed food. Just eat like natural good meat. Like processed, I think it's most important Like the distinction here is between processed and non-processed. Like, I mean, if you, it's better to be vegan than it is to eat processed meat all the time. And I'm not supporting veganism. I'm just saying like eating processed food with lots of chemicals and crap in it and eating lots of sugar, that's what's really bad. You have a bit of sugar here and there, that's all right. But, uh, Alexander Baker, what's your opinion on the Usaberg Buddha? What are your thoughts that the Norse was a more Dharmic religion prior to Christianity? Well, the uh, are you talking about the, the figure on the bucket? Because that's widely regarded to be Irish, so it wouldn't have anything to do with the Norse. Um, and the problem is that that is also, I think that current, that's during Christian Irish time. So it may be a Christian something i don't know for sure what where, where, where that figure comes from um but there's nothing in it to this to, to deter there's nothing we can determine from the fact that the guy's sitting cross-legged about his religion really i don't I think you don't want to jump the gun there um but when you say that the norse religion was a more dharmic religion prior to christianity uh what do you mean like the Norse religion was replaced by Christianity. It wasn't changed by Christianity. Well, the Norse religion wasn't changed into a non-Dharmic religion. And also Dharma just means like natural law. So all paganism is Dharmic um, in that sense. What are your, th uh, uh, thanks for your chat, uh, your uh, super chat, Alexander Baker. Um, Joel Jensen, thank you for your chat too. What are your thoughts on blood and soil in the european i don't understand as an ethnic norwegian can one find the same spiritual enlightenment in america as in norway um yes but it's because as i said like well the indo-europeans moved around didn't they they didn't care but i just explained in the beginning of this this chat this stream about how the icelanders established sacred land and how about how the Anglo-Saxons established sacred land when they moved? So I think you can infer from that what I believe and what you can, can yourself do. I, I don't, I hope, I hope I'm not being rude by saying that because I, I think you've got, you've, uh, you've asked a valid question, but I kind of feel like I already answered it with the beginning of the stream. Um, didn't I? Maybe I didn't. Uh, I thought, I thought that was apparent. Um, but yeah. Let me see what we got here. Well, I'm going to have to wrap it up soon. So, uh, Icelanders were first on the island, I believe, said Upgrade. Now, I think there were Irish monks on there first, actually. Um, there were a few, because there was a time in Celtic Christianity where they were really keen on just finding the most uninhabited place and just a few guys going there. So it wouldn't have been like a big community of Irish people, just a, a few very cold and lonely Irish guys living in a cave or something. Um, oh, you missed the beginning of the stream. I see, Joel. Oh, well, when it when it comes, I'll, I'll put it up so you can just go back and watch it. But I mean, you know, Americans, America, you have, you, it's your land, you know? It's your land. You you took it. You took it. You, your, your ancestors claimed it and uh, own it. That's what I say. Own it. Own, own your land. Like, God, imagine if everyone in England was like, oh, we've got to give him, we've got to go back to Germany or whatever. Or <laughs> because the Celts own land, it doesn't make sense. That's not how things work. Everything is a cycle of, you know, invasions and replacements. That's history. And uh, what you've got to do is uh, just own it and, uh, and, and make your land sacred to you. Are you familiar with I.E. or Bok? 
is it based on general do you mean oral traditions or is it pure bullshittery is pure bullshittery uh it, here I'm going to chill for the uh, Brute Norse podcast again. He's just the last Brute Norse podcast. He talks about these kind of like, there's been loads of people over the years, cult leaders who like try and appropriate pagan religion and just say that they've got this like crazy, you know, they got their own, you know, wisdom that they've taken from like some, either from divine intuition or like a prophet, like a, a pagan Muhammad, you know, and I box one or Eagle box one. He believed in like, drinking semen and crazy stuff it's quite funny that this podcast where um uh brute norse just goes through a whole load of these uh different whack wackos people so yeah um but yeah please do not believe in box saga or in uh the Ura linda book or any of this nonsense just stick with the with the real stuff uh, do you think the non-Indo-European -Euro religions, such as those of the Etruscans, were telluric and matriarchal, like Evola says? Not necessarily. Uh, I think it's possible, but I, as I said before, we really don't know anything about the pre-Indo-European religions. Like, he's not the only one. Who, he said that, but he didn't. It's not right-wingers who invented this idea. It's the left-wingers, I think, who first proposed it. And left-wingers agreed, like... Like it was Maria Gumbatas, the feminist author, she believed that it was like a feminist utopia in the pre-Indo-European religion religions and then the Indo-Europeans brought evil patriarchy but maybe that's true we can say that the Indo-Europeans were patriarchal but we can't say anything about what the pre-Indo-Europeans were like because we don't have anything of their religion to analyze we've got no texts we've got no we've got nothing reliable to understand about them so we've got you know we've got some monuments stone monuments and whatever but here and there but we don't know where one how many religions there were and when one ended and the other began and we don't know what you know I'm not I'm not going to go into it I, I don't. Uh, I think you're 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 just flashing around in the dark when you're trying to talk about what that religion was like, and that is that's what some people like because people are inclined to make stuff up, like ambiguity, because it gives them more space to make up rubbish. Um, okay, I got two more Snapchats. Uh, I'll have to do those before I I finish off, but it's time up now. Uh, Villa Theutonica. Thank you for your contribution. Says, while researching my East Prussian ancestors, I found an Ur grandfather of mine with a name with zero hits on Google. Stigler White. Any ideas on the ethnic origin of this name? Scandinavian? Uh, I don't, it sounds German to me. I don't think it's Baltic. It's going to be a Germanic name. So uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, but however, I would say to you this. Um, it's quite possible that the people on the Ancestry website you're using mistranscribed the name. So look at the original document that the that it, where the name is written and tr make sure that it really says Stiglerbite because that might not be a real name. I spent years trying to understand where my grand great grandfather Vera Russell was born because it said Aiton, and I was like, what's Aiton? And then I realized that the uh, website had mistranscribed Salon as Aiton. And then after then, I could finally figure out that I finally learned that they, my family lived in Sri Lanka because I said in my Sri Lanka film, I didn't know that. And uh, uh, it's it, partly due to this mistranscription. And mistranscriptions are really common um, in the, because I don't know who they get to do these transcriptions, but they're not very good um, in these uh, ancestry websites. Final, final Snapchat. Feral thought. Can urban life be reconciled with pagan heathen life? How do you feel about environmentalism? Uh, well, most pagan religions were, uh, there were many uh, uh, cities in, in pagan Europe. So of course, that's a yes. Um, of course there were, like the whole ancient world was filled with cities. Um, and I, I don't, are you specifically talking about Germanic paganism? Because they didn't have cities as such, but they had big trading centers and things like that. Uh, they didn't live uh, in the same way we do. But, you know, to, you you live when you live now. You don't live in another time. You can't. If, you, if, you're, if your idea for paganism, heathenism is to live, uh, pretend that you're a, temp, a man living in, in the early medieval era, then that isn't a religion. That's just, uh, that's LARPing. So you've got to understand, you've got to integrate your spiritual beliefs with the reality of your uh, of your circumstances now. 
How do I feel about environmentalism? Well, I support it. I'm very against um, single-use plastics, uh, deforestation. I try to concern myself mostly with environmental issues in my air, in my local area. So I especially dislike littering in the area. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I think some of the like, I think environmentalism is also misused. It's been appropriated by globalist organizations with the purpose of the uh, of, of 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 necessitating a transnational uh, system of authority. So I don't. I'm I'm very much in favor of preventing deforestation, uh, for example. But also I I am suspicious of some of the claims of environmentalists at times because you know what really annoys me is that the most vocal and annoying environmentalists are urbanites and often they don't understand anything they try and introduce like the other day i was walking by the river and i see a bloody mink a bloody mink it's an invasive species uh, in britain they don't belong here there's there's european mink but they never lived in britain then there's the american mink and they were used for fur and then these a lot of a lot of them got released because these environmentalists went to the fur farms they've made illegal now the fur farms and just released loads of them well what do these things do they go swim around they eat all the baby fish they eat all the fish they stop they prevent the food from otters so the otters don't have as much habitat and stuff they eat the baby ducklings they eat the baby moorhens they eat all kinds of things and they kill them all and they're very good at it and um we I mean, obviously, in a natural, if Britain was just an, a nature reserve with no humans, it wouldn't really matter that much about the mink because there would be such a diversity of animals that they could, you know, accommodate this extra top predator. But we don't live in a natural environment. Britain is an agricultural area with urban areas in it. Most of Britain is agriculture. And that means that the wildlife here survives in between and in the agricultural spaces. So it's no, there's just a thing as wild land. And this is the same for most of Europe. There are some wild areas, but they're not, but most of the wildlife in Europe does not live in the wild areas. So you've got to understand that you can't imagine that there's this like natural self-serving ecosystem. You can't introduce invasive species. You need to kill them. Really good environmentalist to read, Penti Linkola. He is a Finnish guy. He understands quite well. Like he's all about uh, culling, excess populations of deer or whatever like you have to shoot the deer here because there's too many deer they don't have any predators so we need to manage them we have to shoot foxes because there's an excess of foxes or better yet fox hunting because fox hunting is integrated into our rural traditions and gives the rural people a reason to uh, you know to, uh, to 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 be part of like to respect nature so the hunt is, is something that brings all the classes together and unites them over the environment, the rural environment. So I have, uh, in my I have strong environmentalist views, but they're not these the ones that like these wishy washy hippie types have. Uh, they're based on like the reality of 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 rural life. Um, yeah, I think I, I've gone on for quite long enough now. I've gone over time. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's been uh, a pleasure as always, and um, I will be back. In future i may try to do this every single sunday at six but if i if i can't i'll say so but i'll always announce beforehand so people get to to get to a, 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 a notification that i will be doing these streams but um yeah thanks again i'm going away now <laughs>